Uh, the next uh, step of this uh, thought process, of course, is food chains and food webs. Uh, we talked about primary producers, herbivores, and then one or more uh, carnivores. So let's look at some examples. You, can, uh, prob you have probably heard of the terminology already, food chain, which just implies this kind of uh, linear relation from the producer, like a diatom, which is a photosynthesizer, to a zooplankton in the middle uh, called a copepod. Calanus is the uh, biological name. There are different species, uh, Finmarchicus and so on and so forth. And the copepod is eaten by the Newfoundland uh, herring. Uh, okay, this is a linear food chain. So you can think a little bit about it. So let's say uh, climate change affects uh, primary production because stratification increased, nutrient supply decreased, and primary production uh, decreased. What would happen? Uh, copepod uh, population could drop and herring would be starling. Or some disease hits copepods and the copepods die and then herring uh, probably will starve to death. So this is not a very stable uh, food chain. Or let's say herring is uh, caught in large numbers for uh, fish oil or producing omega-3 and so on. Uh, then you're going to reduce the grazing pressure on the copepod. So the predator of the copepod is disappearing. So you're going to increase uh, uh, the copepod population is going to increase because the, there are not that many herring eating them anymore. So they will begin to graze more and more on the primary production. Okay, so you can perturb the food chain very easily when it is such a simple uh, food chain. Uh, there are food webs where again you have diatoms and dinoflagellates as primary producers or autotrophs at the bottom and then they are eaten by mollusk larvae, copepods, calanus, so you have different types of calanus, tunicates, euphausids and uh, clarocerans and they are eaten by arrowworms, sand eels and so on and then you are up into uh, North Sea herring. So this is the Newfoundland herring which has evolved differently than the North Sea herring, which is uh, evolved on a food web rather than a food chain. People do mathematical modeling to show that uh, complex uh, networks of dependence tend to be stable. If, for example, if you imagine a tree requires pollinators let's, or a seed transfer process, uh, it can rely on many birds and other pollinators or it can rely on one a bird only. Obviously if that bird dies then it can be an issue whereas if you have many that can do for you then you will be more resilient. Okay, More stable network just means that it will be more resilient to perturbations. Even if you knock off someone in the web others can take up and still maintain the food supply to the North Herring Sea. Okay, so there is a branching network of many consumers. Consumers are more likely to survive with alternative food sources. So that's what makes it more resilient or a stronger network. Okay, makes sense? Intuitively it does, right? So let's look at the energy transfer in another way in terms of biomass instead of energy units. Okay. What are the number of individuals uh, uh, and total biomass uh, decrease as uh, we go up uh, the trophic levels? When we say trophic levels, we are not talking about food chains and food webs. That's kind of a dependency chart. Here we are just tracing food of one top predators down uh, to the producer, primary producer, right? So we can start here uh, with a killer whale, which is a tertiary carnivore which eats uh, things like bonito, which is a secondary carnivore, uh, which eats uh, things like anchovies, which is a primary carnivore, and then you have zooplankton, which is a herbivore, and then you have phytoplankton, which is the f bottom of the food chain, which is supporting the whole food chain, right? So once again, you start with uh, one unit needed here. So killer whale is sitting up here. It's, let's say, going to eat uh, certain amount of food so the level below there is has to be 10 times the mass of the killer whale 
okay so we are not doing in terms of energy now uh, efficiency but biomass required to feed a kilo whale okay so you have uh, secondary carnivore and then uh, the, let's say uh, the uh, food that is feeding the uh, carnivore which is the bonito in the second level and then you have 10 times the killer whale mass in the secondary carnivore 100 times the mass of the killer whale in anchovetas or anchovies and the zooplankton is a thousand times the mass of the killer whale so to feed to feed one killer whale you have to produce 10 times the secondary carnivore 100 times the tertiary carnivore 1000 times the herbivore and 10,000 times the mass of the killer whale in the primary producer okay this will lead us to the so-called allometric scaling that I will talk about what is allometric basically it is uh, as opposed to isometric when you say isometric uh, if you take two squares or two cubes or two circles uh, they scale up or scale down by the same uh, amount in every direction whereas in allometric scaling in a simple way if you think about uh, the body of a baby the proportion of the length of the uh, arms, legs, size of the heart, brain are certain uh, fractions when the baby is still very small as it begins to grow up the brain, the heart, the lungs, the limbs, uh, uh, legs versus arms grow at different rates so the ratios don't remain constant so in biology you end up with what are called allometric scaling which are uh, not isometric so they are not the same uh, in every direction okay so that we will use to show how uh, the biomass of a uh, organism relates to the biomass of that whole species so weight of one elephant versus weight of all elephants in the world uh, how do species relate on this kind of scaling that's what is called allometric scaling so I think you get some sense of what we mean by that